intubation, we're gonna show you guys how to perform intubation. I wanna go over the major stuff and then we're gonna delve into the skill. So we're not gonna be doing any of this, right? With the sunglasses, you're gonna use your proper BSI precautions, right? So uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the indications and contraindications of this procedure. So we're gonna talk about indications. So why are we gonna do this? So patient has a failure to maintain or protect the airway. What does that mean? So failure to maintain or protect the airway. Maintain airway, uh, how do I know a patient can maintain a proper airway is the patient is able to swallow, the patient is alert. If the patient cannot do those things, we say that a probable uh, potential of airway compromise. So if I ask the patient their name, they're able to phonate, make sound, they're able to swallow, I definitely know they have protective reflexes. For our purposes, if the patient cannot maintain the airway, they also cannot protect it. What I mean by protection, right? If the patient aspirates, they could get uh, all the gastric contents, go into the trachea, and get uh, uh, pneumonia from that, right? So we want to avoid this. So if the patient has a failure to maintain or protect, we're going to intubate. If the patient has a failure to oxygenate or ventilate, uh, I can give you two examples. We have a patient who has ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or a patient has CHF. They have a lot of fluid in the lungs. So oxygen cannot, cannot diffuse, right, through that fluid to bind to the hemoglobin, right? We talked about the binding in the lungs. So if you have a lot of fluid in the lungs, oxygenation is not going to occur. You have a failure to oxygenate. On the other hand, ventilation, uh, you have a patient such as tight asthmatic who has, you know, status asthmaticus or COPD patients. They have such tight lungs, they cannot exhale. They're retaining that air. So they have failure to ventilate. Even though these patients may have protect, protection of the airway, they may have be able to maintain the airway, but they cannot move air in and out, so they have failure to ventilate. So we're gonna intubate. Uh, expected clinical course. For example, you got a patient who has superficial uh, and airway burns through uh, superheated gases. The firefighters pull them, pull them out of the fire. So even though right now, as I see the patient, airway is patent, he's able to maintain, he, he can oxygen, he can ventilate, but as time goes by, it's gonna swell, right? The edema is gonna swell, so we have to secure the airway. Give you another example. You're doing interfacility uh, transport. You go to hospital A, you have a patient breathing 34 times a minute, altered mental status on CPAP. You have a 45 minute transport time to another hospital. Right? It's safer to intubate them in hospital A before you take them out than have the potential of deterioration in route. Right? Another common example, patient goes to the ER, they're in the emergency room, right? They're, they're in the upright position, they maintain the airway, they take them to the CT scan, laying flat, and the patient coughs, right? So, explain the clinical course. So, all, all these things, right, that I talked about, uh, they will impact, you know, how we essentially uh, go about securing the airway. So, we move. Right? So, the ter determination of patency. So, we talked about uh, the gag reflux is not a good indication of airway patency. So, what that means is that irregardless if the gag reflux is intact or not intact, that tells you nothing, right? So we're not gonna go by having a gag reflux as a clinical indicator of airway protection, that's one, right? We said uh, spontaneous and uh, volitional swallowing, if I'm able to swallow, that tells me that the patient can maintain the airway. If they have full secretions in the posterior oral pharynx, when I open the airway and I look inside, they have secretions, they cannot maintain or protect the airway. So for those patients, we're gonna intubate and protect the airway, right? So we talked about status asthmaticus, a person who has bronchospasm or COPD, right? They have failure to ventilate. ARDS patients or congestive heart failure patients may have oxygenation issues, right? So I'm not talking about those patients who are still at a point where you give them CPAP and they get better. I'm talking about those patients who are much further along their disease process, right? They're, they're altered uh, and you're trying to ventilate them and the set is not improving, right? So those patients we gotta you know, control. And then expect the clinical course, right? I gave you the two examples. I told you about the transport and a facial burn. Another example could be a stab wound, right? A trauma. Somebody got stabbed and they have a hematoma. Hematoma means blood pooling. As the time goes by, by that swelling is going to expand. Blood pressure is going to drop. They may become altered. And now you cannot really see the airway, right? The anatomy will be distorted because of that blood pooling. So it's better to control the airway early in the cycle. Make sense? So if you go to the station and I ask you what are the indications, why are you gonna intubate? So you will say, I have the following indications. 
failure to protect or maintain airway, failure to ventilate or oxygenate, expect the clinical courses to decline. Any questions? Clear? Very good. All right. So what we're going to do after we do our ABCs, right? We're going to start to ventilate. I'm going to show you on the actual procedure. We're going to start to perform BVM ventilations. We're going to place our patient on the monitor, right? I want to see both. You place them on the pulse ox, and I want you to place this adapter here in the, between the EVM, right? And your monitor, anyone you know what this is? Capnography. Yeah, anti idle CO2. Why is this important? You notice I'm placing this on the back mask device, not just on the endotracheal tube. Because every time I squeeze my back and the breath goes in, I see this waveform real time. Right? My number is right here 35. So I see it going up. Full socks, this, this one right here, right? This number is in blue. This has a lag feature to it. What that means is patient has bad hemodynamic status, low blood pressure. This number is in the past. How much in the past? Depends how sick they are. So let's say you see 90% saturation, right? That may be three minutes ago. Their actual saturation now is like 76. You don't know that. What you do know is real time, this. So if I, if I basically, if I place my patient on the monitor and my initial saturation is 90% and I want to get them as high as possible, I squeeze my breath, my breath went in, right? But my sat is not, is not seems to be moving. I don't do this. Why I don't do this? Because I know my breath went in. So I'm going to give it some time. Maybe it's a pulse out, it's like issue. One breath every five to six seconds. Make sense? All right, very good. The next thing we talked about, oxyhemoglobin dissociation therapy. Right? We talked about in the AMP lecture. Why is this important? Why is this? We talked about the stuff shift. And specifically this part. What is this? You're not going to get oxygenation if you lower THC retention much. So that is the next. hemoglobin holds oxygen tighter mm -hmm. or looser? It's tighter, tighter. Tighter. Excellent, right? So if I do this, I'm just going to show you. Uh, if I do this, I'm blowing too fast. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of CO2. I'm going to left shift. Oxygen is going to be in relaxed state. It's going to hold to the oxygen tighter. So you, have, you got a sick patient, no oxygen is being delivered, or very minimal is being delivered. Make sense? So one breath every six seconds. That's number one. Very good. Right. I like that you paid attention. The other important fa uh, factor here is that this is your saturation. This is your pulse up saturation, I'm going to say, right? I put a probe on my finger, right? This here. So we see up until from 100 to 90, it's a slow, slow, slow decline. 90% falls. That means that I have time frame here, but the moment my pulse sucks gets to 90%, I have rapid decline. I have rapid desaturation. I can go from 90 to 70 in a matter of seconds. So what that means for your purposes, if I'm trying to intubate and I kind of see the vocal cords, but I, you know, I really am not really seeing it, I'm like, I almost got it, but Pulse ox is 90, and the instructor is telling you, all right, pulse ox is now reading 90%. What you should you be doing? Should you continue your attempt? No. 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 What should you do? Oh, Pull yeah. away, put back the OPA, go back to oxygenation for how long? Until you get your, your fat back to 99. Oh, to the max value you can, excellent, right? Very good. So uh, they become hypoxemic here, you get hypoxic, anoxic brain injury that we want to avoid, right? Very good. Okay. So this is what I was explaining to you, right? You have relatively long period here. It's a brief period, sharp decline, right? We want to avoid that at all costs. This here is a graph. I'm going to make it a little bigger so to explain. For this scale, you guys are going to get 30 seconds to intubate. That's what the skill sheet says. However, right, if I pre them well, right, for three minutes, get, uh, we know that uh, room air is 21% oxygen, uh, 21 oxygen, 78, 79 nitrogen. If I do complete nitrogen washout, I have 100% oxygen. Let's say, let's say we take a normal healthy person right here, 70 kg. Look from 100 to 90, right? 90 is right here. 90 is right here. How much time you got? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Let's take a sick person, 70 kg. Right? They couldn't get him to 100, but, but at 90, um, five minutes, right? Let's take an obese person, right? Obese person is this guy here, 90. Almost three minutes, right? So you don't really have 30 seconds if you pre oxygenate them well. Why am I telling you? So in the field, when you get out of there, it's not like you got to K 
kill and rush and do all this stuff, right? If you fractionate well, you spend your time diligently, you have some time. Make sense? But for the scale, it's going to be 30 seconds. All right, positioning, right? You had a question? Yes. Um, I'm just curious. One of the indications is um, trouble oxygenating the patient, right? So how do you oxygenate the patient who is not ventilating the patient? Very good. I'm going to show you how we're going to do it with the BBM mask and the OPA in the initial phase, so we're gonna to get to it. So we're gonna use BLS procedures to that, right? But uh, before I get to that, I wanna show you the positioning. Can you come over here for a second? I wanna show you something. Face me, right? Are you able to grab, mm -hmm. to grab them? Right. I don't want you to move your body, I just want you to move your head. Pretend this is a bouquet of roses, and I want you to smell it. Just move your head, right? Very good, stop, stop right there. You see how he aligned his ear hole to the sternum, right? Just by moving his head forward. This is the sniffing position, make sense? We're going to do this position for those patients who do not have, do not have cervical spine injury, no C-spine injury, right? Thank you, you have a seat. So we, we got this patient, we're going to put padding, how, and what am I doing? I'm trying to align, right, the ear hole to the sternal notch. So I'm trying to align this portion to this portion, like, a, like we saw on the right? I'm using the stretcher. The next thing what I want to make sure is my head is parallel to the ceiling. See how the face plane is parallel to the ceiling? Ear hole, sternal notch. Parallel to the ceiling. Why do I need this? The reason why I need this, I want to align my oral axis, laryngeal axis, and pharyngeal axis so that when I intubate, all the axes are aligned so I can visualize my trachea. I can put it into the vocal cord. Make sense? I don't put this position this way to BBM them. The reason I put them in this position so I can visualize the vocal cords more easily. Make sense? If you put them in this position, you're not going to see it very well. Right? So this is a bad position, right? Not to the sternum. This is an excellent position. For EMS purposes, you could use a stretcher. You see how they wrapped it up? Ear hole to the sternum, face parallel. You could use your bunker gear with some fluids. Use your stretcher, right? Uh, here, I'm going to show you, right? You were asking the question, so how we're going to be here. So, first of all, right? We're definitely going to put all our adjuncts, right? We're going to measure our OPA, right? Corner of the mouth angle of the mandible. You're going to use a cross finger technique to insert. And then we're going to use our nasal trumpet. Um, usually I put both. You put a lubricant, slight, slight traction, bevel to the septum, right? Go straight down. So I put both of these, right? If, uh, uh, on the actual patient, you could put a, uh, another one. So two nasal trumpets, oral pharyngeal airway. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take your BVM, you're going to disconnect the mask. Disconnect. You see what I'm doing? This is the skill part. You're going to spread the cuffs, put it on the bridge of the nose. Why I spread the cuffs? Yeah. You got a better feel. Excellent, right? Soft tissues are gonna grip, right? The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do is two-handed uh, triple airway maneuver. So let me show you without a mask. So triple airway is this. I'm gonna take my index finger under the mandible, lift the jaw to the ceiling. Thumbs open the mouth, I lift the head back, right? How it looks with the mask, spread the cuffs, seal, lift right this will give you the best possible air entry and ventilation right uh what do you guys think opa does what's the function of the opa keeps the tongue away from the keeps the tongue away from the laryngeal and raise your hands if you believe that raise your hands if you believe that he says keeps the tongue away from the airway raise your hand okay. so if you believe that that's the wrong answer right the only thing that takes away the tongue from the laryngeal inlet is this maneuver. Because the tongue, the junior glossus muscle, is connected to the mandible, to the lower jaw. This will never, this plastic will not prevent it from occluding. This prevents you from closing the mouth. So the purpose of this device is so you don't do this. You close the mouth. Compression of the summon mandibular tissues and the mandible. What moves the tongue out of the airway is this. Right, there you go. So we're gonna place our mask on, right? I was taking, talking about one hand versus two hand. So one hand is very, actually very bad technique. One hand, you see plant, you have a lateral air leak. I compress my mandible, closing the mouth, and I can compress my some mandibular tissues, the soft tissues on the neck. This is the best technique, right? Even though I'm doing it by myself, right? Why did they do the one-handed? This was taught for the CPR, for the late providers, right? And for them, they said it was very hard to teach all the angles, 
how to pull the jaw up, right? This is hard to do. If you, once you start doing this, you will realize. So they said for the lay, layman, they don't need to know that, right? Let's say you take a CPR class, right, AHA. You work in dermatology clinic. But, but uh, this guy works 911 EMS. How many cardiac arrests is he going to do? A whole lot, right? I work in a derm clinic. My, my training and his training should not be equivalent. So BLS AHA is a bare minimum. It's like the lower tier that you're expected to know. We're going to show you the optimal position, right? So what they said was, right, for the layman, head tilt, chin lift, you put one hand EC plant. But they said for the professional rescuer, they should be taught all the airway, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not rocket science, right? So this was some other studies. They said, what's the best way? So they said the best way is to do this two-handed maneuver, triple airway, right? And what you're going to do is you're going to basically uh, use it, the combination, right, to get the most effective face to mask seal. This was by an anesthesiologist, right, and they said, like, uh, should you use one hand or two hands? Because, you know, anesthesia, they use one hand to have the machine, right? He said the triple area maneuver is the best uh, method, and he says he does not recommend the EC plant for his anesthesia residents. He says don't do it at all. So he uses the two handed technique, right? This was another study, again, they showed that the EC clamp is inferior. Right, they said use the triple airway, right? Two-handed jaw thrust mask technique uh, improves upper airway frequency. And this was another study comparison of two methods for obese patients, right? They said, uh, let's use this technique where you may compress the mandible, or this technique, the one I showed you, right? Which one is better? So they did a study and they looked, I looked at it, right? And they said that uh, group A, right, they start with step one, they start with this, and then uh, they see this technique, 20 of them, 50% fail, and they had to go to this technique. And then with this technique, all of them regained airway frequency. So when they did this chart, this technique was far superior, right? So two-handed technique is far superior. Several studies show that, right? Uh, this is how you do it in the field, right? So if you have enough personnel, do not use the one-handed technique. That's what I'm trying to tell you. In the skill sheet, it does have one hand, but we have a lot of people here, right? Two hands, right? We talked about placement of your uh, nasal airway, oral airway, you're going to put both, like right here, right? This was for how long is your oxygen duration. For now, we're not going to worry about that. Let's go to the basics, right? How are you going to hold the blade? So we pre-oxygenated using two hands, right? We're going to pre-oxygenate for three minutes until my pulse up is 100% or as high as I can get it. While they're doing that, my partners are doing it, I prepare all my equipment. I get my lunatoscope. This is not a handle. This, uh, this is a battery holder. Your grip should be thumbs up. You see how they're holding it? Not like that. You have both better leverage. Number two, you want to have a chicken wing in. Put the chicken wing, chicken wing in, right? See what I'm doing? Oh, man, I'm going. Yeah, come, come over here, stand up. I'm going to show you. This is this is a Mac face down. So this is a Mac 3, and this is a Mac 4. Take a 3, hold it, thumbs up. Right, by your side, and then I'm gonna try to uh, resist my pressure. All right, this is number three. Now, let me do number four. This is number four. Resist, resist my pressure. Which one was easier? Three. Three, because this has a longer, uh, like a lever, right? So when you start, when you're starting out, use a three. You'll, you'll have a better uh, success with the skill initially. But once you get proficient, go with the four. Why? Because with the four, if we'll say a patient, the anatomy is longer. I can modulate my hand. I can move it down or up, depending if I have a small lady, grandma, right? I don't need to go all the way with four. I can just go a little bit. I get to the volecula. I have a big guy, tall guy, right? I, I may need a whole blade. So I can modulate. I don't have to switch my blades three and four. But when you're starting out, right, take a three. It will be easier for the skill, for the initial phases. Make sense? All right. So... Thumbs up, chicken wing in. Your motion is gonna be like, you guys remember rock and suck and robots? Yeah. Right, the, the, this motion? Yeah. Right, that's your motion, right? That's what you're gonna do. Uh, positioning, right, if it's on the stretcher, the head should be between the, the uh, umbilicus and the xiphoid process, right? If it's too low or too high, maybe you need to readjust. Uh, one thing that I see you guys often perform, which I don't advise you to do, you guys start your procedure and you're like this. One hand has this, the tube and the other one has the blade. Do not do this. 
these patients don't come with their mouth open. You're going to use one hand to open the mouth. So, right, one is going to do cross finger, the, the blade is going to come in. Their mouth. Uh, this is a good position, right, in the field. This is also fine, you have uh, movement of the elbow. This is not so good, your elbow is stationary. You have, you, you will have hard time. Do not ever do this, because you cannot control the position, right? Put your padding, put the patient in the proper position. Right? How we're gonna bend the tooth? We're gonna go straight to cuff. You see how at the bottom, right, uh, it's a hockey stick. This I can touch, this is not, this doesn't have to be sterile. The bottom, I adjust in the plastic wrapper. This is sterile. You notice, I have excellent dexterity, right? We try to do this at the top. You see how I cannot really move it anymore? So this is what you want, straight to cuff. You're gonna connect this syringe to it right away. The syringe, Puts air. That is what going to be in the trachea. This is what will prevent aspiration from occurring. Right? Roughly how much of the lip line? Three times the diameter of the tube. So if you got a 7.0, 7 times 3, 21. Keep it in the wrapper. Hold it like a pen or a pencil, for that matter, like this. See, I'm doing it. Don't hold it like this. Oh, like that. And, right, this is what I was explaining to you, pencil, right? Don't hold it like this, or like that. This is what we want to see, right? This is the optimal view, white vocal cords. This is the Cormac Joaquin type 1 grade, this is the best grade you want to get. This is just, uh, it's hard to see when you visualize this, but this is what I want. This is what, when I see this, I put my tube in. How far down? I want the, the, the cuff to go inside past my vocal cord. Uh, anyone knows what this is? Entitled CO2. CO2. I can firm placement on my tube, right? Before I secure it, before I put all this stuff on it. Make sense? Right? Uh, any questions before we go to the skill? Right. So, how about, can I get one of you, you're going to be, uh, actually, two of you come up, you're going to be my partners. Any, come yeah, two of you guys. Right? And you guys can, if you want to watch, come closer, you're more than welcome to do it, right? If you want to come up, come here and here, so you can see the procedure, right? So first step, we said, we start our BLS procedures. I'm going to put my uh, NPA, uh, OPA. We're going to say this patient is altered mental status. They are not going to need sedation. We're going to start to ventilate. Uh, just for the purposes, why don't you put a pulse ox on your finger so we could see your readouts? Yeah. So I have my partners here, right? I'm going to have you spread the cuffs, put the mask on, right, like this, and you're going to start to ventilate. We put a pulse ox on the patient, we connected our entitled CO2. Right. So yeah, this, take this off, spread, and you're going to squeeze. Here, connect it, right? Move your index finger under the mandible. Here, perfect. Lift it up to the ceiling and lift the mandible to you. Excellent. Connect it. One breath every six seconds. Perfect. Count out loud. 1,000, Perfect. 1, 000, right, you guys see, and you could point on the screen, right? You see the pulse ox here, right? Pulse ox, we're going to get to as high as possible, 100 waveform. Patient is on my monitor. I'm going to get the blood pressure, all the set of vital signs. Make sense? I'm going to do this for three minutes. But for the uh, purpose of the scale, I'm going to go a little, you know, move it along. So I'm going to prepare my equipment. I need my blade, right? Uh, I have my two. I usually have my partner hold it. So how about you be my partner and you hold it uh, by my side here, and I put it straight to cuff. You see it? I put my bite block and my securing device by the patient, right? So on the count of three, you could disconnect the bag, remove this portion, make sure the entire CO2 stays connected, uh, and remove uh, all the OPAs and PAs, right? Good. One, two, three. Perfect, right? So I'm gonna go slow so you guys can see. I'm gonna uh, take my middle finger, <laughs> top, right, maxilla, mandible. You see how, if I do it like this, you see how short of a space, but with the middle finger, how much more I got. I go slowly in, I don't like, you do this, you're gonna bleed. Slowly in, and let's see if you, if you can. I inch until I see the sliver of the epiglottis. 
And then I want to sit my blade into the volocal. Can you see the inside of the vocal cord? So I sit into the volecular space and I lift. Right? Perfect. I see the vocal cords. I don't want to remove my view. So I want, can you pass me the two bright in my hand? I come in from the side to not obstruct my view. And I go straight in. I want to go just distally enough that my tube goes past the vocal cords. Right? And I'm always cognizant of my monitor. If this drops at any point to less than 90, I got to stop. I, I inflate. I check my pilot balloon. It's good. I hold my hand on this so I don't take this off. The entire time before it's secured, take this off. Connect my device. And you squeeze. Chest rise, right? First thing I do is gold standard, entitled CO2. What's the number? 3545. It's not showing here because we, we did not connect it. Plus, this mannequin doesn't make CO2. Right? <laughs> Any of you guys have a stethoscope on you? Yes. Right? Can I borrow it? This, this is called me being unprepared. Right? So you guys are going to learn this technique using it with one hand. You see how am I trying to open this? You're going to put it in yours. I'm not going to put it in my ears because it's yours, but you're going to put it in one hand. Check negative epigastric sound. Then to the side. Positive. Squeeze. Positive. What happened if I put it too deep? Things go into the right. Right main stem. Excellent. So I expect right-sided sounds, mm -hmm. absent left happen. sound. If I have this, deflate, pull back until it's about 21 at the lips, reinflate, and recheck the lung sound. All right? Everything confirmed? All right? Entitled CO2. Pull sucks. 95, <coughs> right? I see 96. Heart rate, right? Then I will secure. So the way we secure is this is the bite block. First thing. See how I'm holding it? I'm going to put this in the mouth. So if the patient were to jump down, right, it's not going to occlude it. Next thing you want to do is connect your Velcro. And the last part of this will be this bolt. Once this is done, I recheck that it's secure. I'm going to reconfirm, right? <coughs> Negative epigastric, positive lung sounds. Entitled CO2, waveform capnography, right? Pulse oximeter, right? So at this point, my tube is secured. If the patient has any secretions coming through the endotracheal tube, we're going to do uh, sterile suctioning. I'm going to show you that later with the proper uh, equipment, right? But if there's any blood or any vomit, we're going to do sterile suctioning, <coughs> right? Uh, the, if you see my protection here, what I'm missing, I'm missing eye protection. I should have glasses on, right? Face protection. I, other than that, everything sh should be fine. Any questions? Anything at all? Anything not clear? So the three minute, is that hard or fast? Or if you see someone that's like not getting better after like a minute of ventilation, because yeah. you're just going to go for it. <clears throat> Sometimes you have patients who have ARDS, and then you need peep to stand the alveoli open. So if those cases who I ventilate for three minutes and the pulse sucks is not improving, I connect my peep valve to it, and I dial my peep five to ten. Okay. If you don't have it, if you don't have it, let's say you don't have this device, you, you get it to the highest you can, and then you go with your procedure. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Uh, all right, thank you. We're going to break into...